My name is Andrew Galante. I am 28 years old and I'm the fifth generation of Ferrara Bakery and Cafe. Uh, we are the oldest espresso bar in the entire United States. We were established in 1892. We've been serving coffee here since 1886, but we became a legitimate business in 1892. We come from Avellino. So my family got here, uh, my great, great uncle, Antonio Ferrara. He was the, um, the gentleman that's created Ferrara Bakery who a family member of mine ended up doing business together, and uh, that's when Ferrar came about. I don't know the exact year he came here, but I believe it was in, in the middle of the you know 1850s and 60s. Okay, and how did he get here? With, uh, I do not know how he got here. I'm assuming probably a boat. A boat. <laughs> did he come here with his uh, family or somewhere or by himself? I believe he came here with his family, yes. Okay. I believe he came did here they with already family. know someone in here in, in, in New York or did they not know anyone? No, they did not know anyone. So they came here, um, they, uh, we got this piece of property, his, his dad, Peter Lapori, who is a second generation, was born in Italy. He came here as well, and um, yeah, that's really it. My great uncle and my grandpa were born right in this building on the third floor, and they lived here for a little bit as well. And how did your family settle once, uh, once they arrived here in America? The life was good. We were one of the only pastry shops around. We were one of the only places in this part of New York, mostly all of New York, that sold espresso, so this was the spot for everyone to come. And how hard was it to, to create this activity, to create this uh, cafe bar? It was very hard. So as you as you know, like I said, I'm the fifth generation. Building something after one generation is not easy. When my family did come here, we were one of the only bakeries, pastry shops around. So it did make it a little bit easier since there wasn't competition. As the world evolved, there was much more competition. There's bakeries on every corner. But people do know we are the best and we are the oldest. So we stuck to our bread and butter. We didn't change anything that wasn't broken. And that's basically what allowed us to survive so long. So we still have like uh, our, our product. We still have the same recipes from 1892. We still have the same work ethic, the same ethical awareness behind the business so that's how we survived all these years keeping it tight keeping it inside the family and making sure we work super hard we do not have any other shops this is our only location this is the one of a kind how old are you and what's your name why you have to remind me <laughs> I'm se I'll be 74 in July and uh, my name is Ernesto Rossi my family's from Naples and Avellino now, my grandfather came here in 1900, okay. and uh, he came from Naples, and in 1910 he started this business. Did he come uh, by, his, uh, by himself or with a family? No, he came alone, he came alone, but he had a brother that was here already. He was a barber, okay. he was a barber. You know, did, he, he, did he work here in the Little Italy or somewhere else? No, Little Italy, here. Okay. And then when my grandfather came here in 1900, and then in 1910, he opened this business. He sold newspapers in Italian, mm -hmm. magazines in Italian. And then somewhere in the 1920s, he got involved in publishing music. He used to go back to Naples every year and participate in the song festival in Naples called Petit Grotta. Mm. He published Neapolitan music, Italian music in the United States. We have copyrights from the Library of Congress going back to 1915. Most of the material is basically Neapolitan from Naples. As years went by, we kept adding different things. Uh, cookware from Italy, marketing per cafes, coffee pots, machine to make pasta, dishes to serve pasta. And then as time went by, then souvenir items. T-shirts, Little Italy, but mostly cookware items to cook in the Italian kitchen. Basically, everything is has got to do with Italian, basically. It's an Italian gift shop. All these souvenir items here, like the, the card and all this stuff, we sell all over through the United States. We wholesale all this merchandise. So if they have a festival, San, San Antonio or whatever, wherever it's at, they call somebody like us and we give them supply of merchandise to sell. We used to sell a lot of music, but the sales on music have dropped dramatically. Yeah, we used to sell, yeah, they're streaming. We used to sell CDs from, from vinyl to cassettes to CDs. Now, nothing selling, because like, they stream everything. 
we sell a lot of religious articles, saint, saints, yes. Santa Padre Pio, Santa Antonio, Baron de Gesù Christ. We sell a lot of that, yeah. In Brooklyn, there's another one more store left like this, and maybe in the Bronx, one or two more stores, and that's it. Yeah, my name is uh, Yanni, you know, I'm 35, 35. Yeah. From New York, man. Oh, yeah, you know what? Well, you know what time is it? So we represent, baby. So I'm American. From my parents are Mexican. So I look like African, right? And Italian. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm Italian. A Nero Italian. Which part of Italy? <laughs> Yo, Napolitan. Napolitan. Yeah, Nero Napolitan. So you, your grandparents were from Italy. Italy, Nata. <laughs> yeah, Napoli. Si mangia bene When did they arrive? Here. Over here, so they came immigration since 1940 after the World War II. They ran from Missolini. Did your grandparents arrive here by themselves or of they arrived with their friends? Friends, of course, with friends. Do you know if it was easy for them to live here? Of course, it was easy because everybody came to the island. island. So everybody came around. There was a big community over here, so you know. Everybody get inside, you know, and they help out a lot of people. You have a lot of ch the churches were involved. Mm -hmm. the Catholic church receive a lot of people and they get everybody. Back in the day, it used to be different. And did they come yes. here by themselves or did they already know some other Italians who had Yeah, you yeah, have a few Italians over here, but that's when they, everybody came around. So, you know. And you know, every community that came from different countries that come together to at least meet someone who early arrived over here. So those guys receive them, help them up with the help of the church and everybody get integrated to the society. Did you have any type of uh, racism uh, against your family or against the Italian people that came out here? No, so when we first came here, there was not much racism toward the Italian. This area was only Italian people. So this was an area where there was hundreds of thousands of Italians within four or five blocks. So we were in a perfect location. It was where everyone was. All the Italians migrated here, right here on uh, Grand Street and Mulberry Street. No, it was just your safe place. So yes, like, our safe place, on. yes. Those hundreds of thousands of Italians were coming in here on a daily basis. The streets out there were all cobblestoned with horses and carriages. People were selling fruit, they were selling vegetables, all that good stuff, and then they were coming here. So it was, it was like an Italian market outside with some delicious espresso and pastries in here. So our biggest clientele back then was Italians. It has expanded now ever since. And that expansion really started in like the 60s and 70s. This is a photograph of Mulberry Street, 1900. Yeah, look, Milo Novacen, the 1900. Francis Ford Coppola, the director of The Godfather, designed the film to look like this. We started in 1910. In 19, late 1929 was the Depression. A lot of businesses went under, went bankrupt. They closed up. When they first opened, they opened uh, 187 Grand Street, half a block away from where we are now. They rented three stories in the building the store and two apartments above for $200 a month. Then they move out and then they move back and they only paid $50 a month during the depression for the store. There was no money. People uh, they all lost their jobs. What happened is when the people arrived in Little Italy, Little Italy, so they stay there, or the community. And when the Italian came, they used to be hated. They didn't want no Italian in America. So when the Italian comes, they were there like, uh, Trash. It's like they didn't want to see them because everything was related to Italia. It was Drangata, La Cosa Nostra, and all the stuff. So it's like, yo. My grandfather got, had a few, he had one song that was written here in New York by a Neapolitan songwriter called A Cartolina Nabla, postcard from Naples. The song was written here in New York and it became a big hit. And he brought it back to Naples. It became a hit in Naples, too. So every once in a while, he would get a song that did well, and he would make the royalties. They would make good money on the song. Because at that time, they used to make the uh, sheet music. So they would make sheet music for piano, vocal, for uh, all the different instruments. And then they would make um, the pianola rolls for the player pianos. 
They used to make those. At that time, in the 1920s, they sold for $1.25, and they would sell them to the stores for 75 cents. And then then from, from selling sheet music and pianola rolls, then they started selling records, vinyl, but they were called 78 RPMs. We sold a lot of music, but like I said, now they, they stream. People don't buy any of it. They manage, and they kept adding different merchandise. Started to import coffee pots, coffee makers from Italy, pasta machines from Italy, dishes, bowls, cups, sauces, religious articles, presepia, the nativity for Christmas, and all these things. The Italian community was very, very big. It was like still on this block where I grew up here in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. There were all Italians that lived here. And Little Italy was very big. My name is uh, David Cenci. I was born in 1961, so 63 years uh, the day after tomorrow. He was born in Rome, lived in Rome until uh, 22 years. I graduated at uh, Louis in uh, business administration. And right after uh, that, I graduated in July. In uh, October, I moved to New York. And I've, uh, I've been there ever since for uh, my family business. Uh, the first uh, 20 years, I was 90% uh, of my time in New York. Now I travel back and forth and I spend six months in New York and six many years. My wife and family are in New York. My children were born in New York. They live in New York. How did your business in America start? We started in 1982 uh, as a business, even though my father, before me, uh, went there uh, as uh, an opportunity for investment. In a time where in Italy things were a little, uh, uh, let's say, complicated business-wise, we are talking about uh, late 70s. I accompanied him, I was uh, your age, I was 16, 17 years old. Uh, as an English translator. The business that is actually our business, which uh, uh, we were founded, my grandfather started this business in 1926. We wanted to expand and uh, uh, New York was a very fascinating city and that's when we started. And so we found a location. We opened the business in uh, April uh, 1982. It's given us an international dimension, which um, is very successful. Was it the, the trip with your father, he convinced you to live in New York or something else convinced you to go live there? No, no, I, I was used to travel, I was used to be independent. For me it was a big opportunity. There was one incentive to work abroad was one way of being exonerated from the draft. How did they treat you when you arrived there and how did you think you would have been treated if you arrived there in the, in the early 1900s? Uh, I arrived there uh, in uh, early 80s, so I was uh, 22 years old. New York in the 80s was a fantastic city. I was privileged in the sense that because of the business, I had also the opportunity of uh, a place to stay. And, uh, but New York, in the, that, like all the world in the 80s, was an uh, uh, easier place uh, to live and for a young person, uh, and New York was very exciting. American people in New York especially are very friendly, no matter what people say. So do you reckon you went there in the like, golden age for what you wanted to do? Uh, it was a... You can say it was a golden age. You know, the 80s were really uh, great, as they were the 20s. In America, the 20s are called the Roaring Twenties. Before the Wall Street crash in 1929, it was a golden age for immigration also for uh, all kinds of uh, people. But in the 80s also for uh, young people like me and uh, older people who had uh, businesses, uh, because you know, everything, you know, the economy was booming, every, the, you know, the country was, uh, was growing, and I'm talking Italy, like France, like Germany, like uh, US. So, but uh, yes, those, the 80s and 90s uh, were, uh, were great. I think in the 1900 it would have been very different. You know, I didn't have to go through Ellis Island, which we visited. They didn't need to book me. I didn't need to spend three weeks on a boat. It was a, you know, eight-hour flight. Did you have any contact with the general community of Italians in New York? Yes, I had a lot of contacts with the Italian community. Not the Italian community from Little Italy. It was not my world. There was a big, young Italian community of young people who were either... Mostly they were working, so it was the time when many people went there to do MBAs and everything. So 
plus you end up dealing with the consulate. You develop friendship with the owner of the Italian restaurant when you go once a week to eat a plate of pasta. Uh, the answer is yes, but it was all yes, all the Italian uh, uh, young people who were studying there. There is still an Italian community related to uh, the business Italian community. So you always have relationship with the, uh, the people that work at RAI. RAI in the 80s and 90s was a very, uh, very present organization in the United States. And there is an Italian American, uh, there are Italian American Chamber of Commerce. There is a, an Italian American Foundation for Cancer Research. So yes, I'm, I'm involved in all of those things. And I started getting involved back then. So I always had a relationship with the Italian Trade Commission. So I've always been in contact. Uh, I mean, the, the true answer is yes, I've always been in contact with the Italian community. It's, it has evolved over time. Yeah, Yeah, we have a lot of Italians. Yeah. Now they live in Long Island. So if you go to the Bronx, that's where the Italian is to be too. The Italian, a certain area in, Ita in the Bronx, little Italy, they have a little Italy there. But everybody move out. Yeah, but if you want to see the real Italian, you have to go to Long Island, Little Lake, or Staten Island, that's where all the Bay Ridge, most of the people there are Italian. But you will be surprised nobody speaks Italian. They're proud to be Italian because they go home. They have nothing to hide anymore. And so now Italian are part of the, yeah, the class, you know, the high class. They want to, that's why the reason, that's one of the reasons why they didn't want to speak Italian. But most of the people, they're just Italian with name, but they don't speak Italian. They feel like they're going to get rejected like all the migrants. You know, like me, I get rejected because I'm a citizen over here, but I have an accent. So I'm like, I'm not from here. So that's the reason why most of the Italian wanted the kids just speak English. They don't want them to speak uh, Italian because if they speak it, they're going to have an accent. So if they have an accent, they feel like they're rejected. Your heritage uh, defines you in America. Uh, you may not, and in some cases you may get discriminated going back to your things, you know. If you were Asian uh, during uh, the outburst of COVID and everybody thought that it was the Chinese uh, flu or the Chinese fault. Everybody has their own uh, areas. There is a lot of people tend to live together. If you go to New York, there are, uh, and you go to Queens, there is, okay, this is where the Lebanese people live. This is where the Indian people live. This is where the um, Chinese, Vietnamese, very section. The Greek people, there's a big Greek community in New York. They're separate, but they become very integrated. If you think that the CEOs of the top uh, four companies in uh, America are all Indians, first generation Indians, you know, Microsoft, Google, they're all uh, IBM, they're all Indians. So America is like everybody come from somewhere and get together. As long as you know Native American, you come from somewhere. Only the black people that come from to the slavery, they don't know where they came from. But to the family trees, they can know where they came from. But otherwise, everybody came from somewhere. They know where they came from. They might lie to you with the migration, people coming, the people recognize like Joe Biden is still going to to be Irish. Yeah, Joe Biden is still going to be Irish. Trump will tell you my father comes from Germany. You don't know Trump is from Germany? Of course. Your father is not far along from Germany. He came here because he didn't want to listen to the military. His mom was cleaning the house from Scotland. She came here, she never speak English. So those are the people start going up. So everybody start going up, getting richer, and now they become like American. But back in the day, you, when you say I'm an Italian, everybody run away from me. You understand? Yeah. Because that's the way America is. That's why they call me African American. They call me Italian American, Irish American, German American, you know, Indian American. That's what America is. Again. My family still goes to Italy on a yearly basis. I do not think they plan on moving back there, but we are always interested in going to Italy. On, like I said, on a yearly basis, we still uh, have connections in Italy with our products, so we always visit our facilities. 
and we um, we always touch base with our resources and our um, vendors to make sure our product is good. So we always do go to Italy once a year, but we do not plan on moving back to Italy. We have to make sure we take care of the, the storefront here. Are you still in touch with your family in Italy? No. So my family in Italy, I have no idea. Who they are no longer there. Oh, okay. So this place, like I said, 131 years old. So everyone that was in Italy moved here. They did the business, and, and, that's it. and that's it. Those people are all gone. And how often do you go to Italy? I haven't gone in, I used to go every year to the gift show in Milan. I haven't gone since 2007. The last time I went to Italy, 2007, I went to Naples. They had a conference on Neapolitan music. My grandfather was a publisher of music. They, I, I went to the conference. And then my grandfather also had a brother that was a famous artist in Italy. His name, Edrigo Rossi. He was very popular. He used to draw for Il Martino, the newspaper. Mm, wow. yeah. And uh, he used to also draw the opera posters. But he died young. He committed suicide. Very tragic. He died in the 19, early 1920s. And... Uh, in fact, I see some of his paintings on eBay. Yeah. Hmm. So I'm trying to get one to put in here myself. Is it kind of hard to find them or? or Somebody has one on eBay, they want $2,300 for one of the paintings. But if, how can I really make, no, that's, I mean, they have a signature, but I don't really know if it's him or not. And what about the Italians from like third or fourth or fifth generation? Do you think they, detached from their homeland and they fully integrated to, to America and they think they're fully American or do they still have uh, any type of strong contact with Italy? They still have a strong contact with Italy because uh, every third generation guy has uh, a third generation cousin in Sicily or in Calabria or everything. My barber, which is uh, probably a third generation I would say, or either a second or a third generation, he always spends uh, August in uh, Ashitrezza because that's uh, where he's, uh, the rest of his family. So every Italian has, uh, with very few exceptions, incredibly strong ties with Italy. They really think of it as still the motherland. They feel more Italian than American. They would never move back, I, I would venture to say, but uh, they definitely feel Italian. And do you think this happens uh, with uh, immigrants from other parts of the world as well? I, I think so. I have uh, many interactions for work with both uh, Mexican and uh, Puerto Rican. And Puerto Rico is America, but still, let's say Latin American, and they always uh, go back. Uh, I have relationship with uh, Asian people uh, from Hong Kong and China, and uh, they tend to go back. As the generation pass, probably less so. And what happens here in Italy? Are you considered the American? Well, I am, but because I love America. So, oh, here comes the American. Sometimes, yes, they do. My friends tease me. You get used to certain things. So you go to a restaurant in America, you have to leave a tip. Here, sometimes, you not necessarily. So sometimes, oh, no, don't, don't let David pay, because otherwise he leaves too much money as a tip. So from these small things to a way of uh, life, uh, we walk much faster in New York <laughs> here in... But these are silly things, but uh, I spend more time in America than here. I've lived in America, I'm 63, 62, and I've lived in America 42 years of my life. So they do think I'm, uh, I'm American. You know, not in a derogative way, but uh, I mean, for the first 10 years I came to Italy, maybe two weeks per year, some years I didn't come at all. I never came for Christmas, uh, you know. And would you ever go back to Italy to live there or? Of course, you know, you can't, you know if you want one time Italian, forever Italian. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're proud to be Italian, baby, you know what I'm saying? In the 1800s and the 1900s, there were many Italians there, no? And uh, what about now? Are they still, do they, do the Italians still live here? So or? Italians still live here, but nothing like it used to be. So our clientele back in the day, which we just spoke about, was mostly Italian. Now the word got out that we are the best bakery in the United States, so we get all different eth ethnicities here. So how much did it change this? Uh... Changed a lot. There's not many Italians left here. Mostly all passed away or moved, or now whoever stood here, they're dying. 
back in the 1960s and 70s, as they grew up, they got married, they moved to get a better life. Don't forget these these apartments here. These are tenement house, tenement buildings. You know, you have to walk up. Some some of them are five stories high. You have, when I was a kid, we had to climb five five stories to go on to to, the, to our apartment. I grew up on Mulberry Street, and then in 1960, my father rented the apartment. We went one floor down to the fort, <laughs> mm -hmm. so we only had to walk up four stories instead of five stories. We had two apartments in one. It was a very big apartment. I wish I still had that apartment because it's right now they're very expensive to live here. And that's another problem. Whoever was living here, they were under rent control laws, so they paid a low rent. But if you move in here now, you pay, they call market value, and the rents are extremely high. They're starting over $2,000 a month for a smallest apartment. Or oh, somebody coming from Italy here now, it's too expensive. That's the problem. I live in Brooklyn, but I'm here every day. I come down here every day. And uh, do you rent this, uh, this place or it's yours? I rent this space. I don't own it. Hmm. That's the only bad pro That's the only problem I really have, that uh, we don't own the property. It would be a big, big difference if I would have owned the property because the rent is extremely high. The gift shops you see here on Mulberry Street, they were Italian, then the Chinese took over. Now they're not even, the Chinese don't even have a gift shop. They're all from Bangladesh. Okay. And in Italy, the same thing. If you go in Rome, Venice, Naples, they have the gift shops. Back in the 60s, 70s, when people, after they finished school, they got married and they moved. They wanted to get their own homes. So a lot of people moved from here, Manhattan, into Brooklyn, Staten Island, Long Island, because they were able to get their own home and their own home to have a little backyard, a garden, and better schools for their children. So basically what happened is that the Italians went up the ladder. They bettered themselves. And then whoever remained here, mostly now, they're all passing away. Not many people left. The, the more people start getting richer and they get out of the communities, they don't want to stay in the ghetto. So that's why it's in little Italy now, is a lot of Asian live there. So the early Italian get richer and they got money now and they go to Long Island to live in peace. Many of them are in Bay, Bay, Bay Ridge and Staten Island. If you go to Staten Island, out of 100%, Maybe like 60% all are Italian, but nobody speak Italian there. They say, capice, capice. <laughs> That's what we say. Why do you think most Italians are, live now in New York? I would say Long Island, and a lot of them went to New Jersey, not New York. So Long Island is a part of New York, but New Jersey is not. If an Italian were to move now to New York, yeah. where would you rather go to live? <sighs> Anywhere. I would say in Brooklyn, Staten Island, Queens, Long Island. But in Manhattan, it's going to be very expensive. Yeah. Okay. The two easy answers are uh, depends on your budget and depends on uh, where you're going to. If you go there to study, my recommendation is going to the university dorms. No question. If you can afford it in New York, you can live in Manhattan, but it's not very easy. It's very expensive now. I think it's important to uh, live close to where your main occupation is. So if you have to have an hour and a half commute, if you have to spend an hour and a half of train to come to work, and that, that, that affects your way of life and your well-being. So, but the young people go a lot to, to Brooklyn, which is much more affordable, and it's, you know, four stops, subway stops, so it's nice. If you like uh, less cement and more uh, grass, uh, the Bronx has some very nice areas with uh, gardens and things. But then if you want fun, you have to take Uber and come to Manhattan for a party. <laughs> so. yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. If you need any other my information, you you here, you're welcome. I'll you give you my hand. And look, my, my, my email is on here. Oh, yeah. The, Anything, you send me an email. Italy. Yeah, we hold that thing, man. Yeah, I hope I help you guys in my hope. Yeah.
sì, sì, sì. scritto in italiano in no complimenti per l'inglese perché... oh, grazie quando c'è mio nonno è Garibaldi è nero sì Garibaldi è nero nero Garibaldi è mio nonno lasciatemi cantare con la chitarra in mano lasciatemi cantare una canzone piano piano